Um, the first thing is to um, give a very warm welcome to you all for taking the time out on a, a Monday morning for to be able to join us for a, around 75 minutes. Um, I'd particularly like to thank uh, the, the contributors, our speakers, um, and everyone who's prepared material for this as well. Um, it's, it's very much appreciated. Um, I think that uh, what you what you will hopefully find is a very varied format here. Um, we're going to have a mixed uh, presentation of live as well as pre-recorded sessions. Um, the latter have been necessitated literally by conflicting um, uh, appointments, etc. But you know, equally grateful for colleagues who've taken the time to pre-record. Um, what I would encourage is to make this in, as interactive as possible, is to, to say to the audience, if you do have any questions, please feel free to use the chat function. What we were planning to try to do was to actually uh, feed any questions in to the panel session at the end. There's going to be at least, I hope, 20, 25 minutes for some Q&A. Um, and so do put your questions in the chat. You will also notice, I hope, that the meeting's being recorded and it will be available on the website after the event. So um, if you wanted to hear something back or send it to colleagues who can't make it, then, then it'll be available. So um, I would just uh, like to, as I say, um, sort of just reflect a little bit on where we are um, in this first part from myself before I um, pass over to uh, our, our senior representatives um, to give their own reflections. Um, we're now, believe it or not, uh, well over two years into the life of our Academic Health Science Centre. And I think it's fair to say that it is absolutely going from strength to strength. Um, as director of, of the Academic Health Science Centre, Newcastle Health Innovation Partners, I, I've been absolutely blown away, to be perfectly honest, by the level of commitment and engagement from all of the partners and, and their commitment to the, to the cause and for making this work. There have been some changes in leadership over the last uh, year. It's not been because of the AHSC, it's because of various um, life cycles and, and others moving on. So I would just like to highlight that Pam Smith, who's had to send her apologies today, has taken over as a Chief Executive Officer of Newcastle City Council, um, took over from Pat Ritchie, and the City Council have always been very, very supportive of the, of the HSC. James Duncan um, has taken over as CEO of, of the CNTW Trust. Um, Hannah Powell, um, I'm not sure if Hannah's uh, been able to make the call today, but Hannah is... Uh, uh, currently Directorate Manager in Newcastle Hospitals Trust. She is the new Chief Operating Officer for NHIP and will be taking over in, from that, in that role in early September, literally. Um, so she will bring a very interesting and novel perspective and a lot of dynamism to the, to the role, having taken over the substantive position from uh, Peter Noble, who, as you know, left uh, for a, a senior role uh, in, in um, a collaborative down in Lincolnshire. And I would just like to put a shout out at this point to Catherine Rogers and to Amy O'Brien, who've been holding the interim reign so very firmly and, and keeping us on track in the interim. I'd also like to welcome Moira Cushlow, who's Executive Chief Nurse at Newcastle Hospitals. Um, Moira's taken over as the Chair of the People and Culture Committee, and you'll be hearing from Moira just uh, very shortly. So the partners really are committed to uh, the, the, the uh, Academic Health Science Centre. This is evidenced in many different ways, and not least actually in terms of, of, of actual real commitment financially and uh, team playing in the broader sense of the word, including commitment to coming down for interviews, being involved in mock interviews and so on, availing of their experience. There are many different ways in, this, in which commitment has been really evidenced. And this has led to a whole number of successes successes and, and progress over the past year. And I'm only going to, to mention a couple of really. I mean, for example, we've received over 200,000 through the Office for Students, working with Health Education England and the Integrated Care System to develop a course in digital health that focuses on upskilling the healthcare workforce. And that's involved multiple different partners. Um, and it was a real, a real um, benefit and, and very clearly involved and went in through NHIP. Um, again, multiple partner um, uh, 
contributions to um, a bid that is currently pending for the uh, NIHR Patient Safety Collaborative which has involved at least three of the partners. Um, we're waiting to hear the outcome of that, but it's for multi-millions. And again, it would be a fantastic thing if we were successful with that. Um, there's another very significant bid which the council are involved with uh, in the NIHR Health Determinant Research Collaboration call. And again, we're over the first hurdle for that one and waiting to hear in the final uh, uh, outcomes of that one. We've also put in a really competitive bid, we believe, for the NIHR Leaders Support and Development Programme tender, which has linked the academy with the business school in the university. And that's been a really novel experience and really a lot of enthusiasm from the business school. And then finally, again, through multiple colleagues, including John Isaacs, who I think is now, yes, John's on the call, um, the EPSRC Digital Health Hub bid, again, is very heavily involving NHIP. So there are a whole raft of things. I'm trying to give you there some very tangible examples as to, you know, there's real substance behind what we're trying to achieve here. And this is pulling together partners in a way that perhaps might not have occurred before the life of the Academic Health Science Centre. And this is coupled with long-term aspiration in the areas of the academy. Again, you're going to hear from Dave Jones in a pre-recorded clip about the, um, the, the NHIP Academy. Um, for early career researchers, which is very broad in its remit um, and very exciting in, in what it hopes to achieve. John may well want to pick up on the research satellites, which are again, picking out areas of commonality and uh, strength across all of the partners, which are very, very exciting, including more recent developments in areas like sustainability and mental health. Um, we've got some really interesting thoughts and ideas and Moira may well want to talk further about what the people and culture group um, are, 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 are intending to try and do. And then let's be let's be honest, this is not all about inward facing. A lot of this is international profile and we are well linked in with the International Academic Health Science Centre Network involved in work, for example, on the learning health systems and more besides. So um, this is doing an awful lot to get Newcastle on the international radar that particularly links us in with North America and some of the real prestige organisations that they have over there. So it has definitely led to a bit of a step change in the profile of the partners and the partnership in general um, in, on the worldwide stage. So that's enough from me. Um, I am now going to pass over to um, Dame Jackie, um, who's going to give her reflections on, on NHIP, particularly, I think, over the past year and maybe going forwards. Jackie. Thanks very much, David. And hello, everyone. It's great to see so many people joining us um, in this conversation this morning. So like, like David, I mean, I, I can hardly believe where the last couple of years have gone, David, since, uh, you know, we, we were announced, as it were. That's not an easy badge to win. Um, but now we have it, we really must make sure that we, we take good care of it. And I, it does really feel to me that we're building Newcastle and the city region, in actual fact, um, into a real research powerhouse. And for all the reasons that you mentioned, David, this is going to be so important. Um, you know, as a healthcare NHS chief exec, um, it's probably stating the obvious to this audience, but I, nevertheless, I think it does need restating. that obviously the research that we do together goes beyond those sort of sci scientific breakthroughs and, and the discovery of new treatments, although they're really, really important. But it, it plays such a central role in improving patient care, improving patient um, experience. The, the kind of evidence base is, is really, really solid for that. And as a doubly rated outstanding organisation, you know, it's, it's really central to what we do. We know that it really helps with things like um, satisfaction, you know, and, and career progression and retention. And those things are really, really important where we're in such a competitive workforce environment and it's it was a really live example for me that's still really memorable um just a few weeks ago our trust board meeting we heard um we always have um, a patient and, and staff story and we heard a story from one of our clinicians um a, a woman named Rasheen. she qualified as a physio in 2018 and within a year she'd started her her clinical academic journey um, and she was really interested in uh, designing and evaluating innovations to improve mobility 
after surgery. Um, she has, you know, absolutely developed new training resources that we're now using uh, to promote inpatient, improved inpatient mobility. And in, in terms of career, you can see she's just gone from strength to strength. She's progressing with a clinical academic fellowship now. But David, you mentioned a little bit about the relationships across the city. And I think through this partnership, you know, we, we, we are starting to really develop a, a citywide culture of innovation uh, and enhance the support available to all the many people that are involved in, in research. And, and of course, you and I often talk about growing the next generation of researchers so that there are more careers like Rasheen's um, and more patients who are benefiting from the improvements. We've made a number of joint appointments recently. Uh, we've got five senior clinical uh, fellowships who are really helping translate that research into real world benefits. Um, just a shout out for Tom Hellier, who's an honorary uh, consultant anaesthetist, who's just been awarded almost two point million, um, a two million grant to study whether antibiotic exposure in critically ill patients with sepsis can be safely reduced. That's so, so important. And of course, you know, what we're after here is to speed up uh, the time it takes um, in the healthcare arena to access new and better quality treatments. That's that's really what it's all about um, um, for me. Um, and I think we're demonstrating that uh, week on week. The Academic Health Science Centre and this partnership is particularly important, David, you've mentioned this to Newcastle and the North East, not least of all, because I hope it can contribute to bringing our population um, the levels of health enjoyed elsewhere nationally. That's not the case in the moment. And a lot of our work is focusing on reducing um, health inequalities. And David, as you say, I'm learning as I go on this journey, the two recent trips to London where we bid for, as you say, significant funding. I'm keeping everything crossed this week and in future weeks. Um, but you can see there, you know, that some of the bids there that around things like safe management, of polypharmacy and patients with comorbidities, that's going to be very, very important, um, particularly as we recover from the pandemic in, in the next couple of years. So I think, you know, the collective world-class research expertise that we're building here, areas like ageing, multiple long-term conditions, um, they're coming through loud and clear. We are being noticed. It's really vital, you know, when we have to compete with London and the Golden Triangle for resources, um, that we, we do keep uh, banging this drum. But I'm really, really excited. I think we've got exciting plans to, to join, grow our joint capability uh, in the future. We're thinking about, for example, the important role that data plays and the use of AI in, in the work. So I can already see the difference um, this partnership is bringing, um, but gosh, you know, let's uh, wait to hear the outcome of recent recent sort of bids. Um, we've really, really, uh, I think, got a very uh, rosy future. Um, and it's thanks to a lot of people on, on this call. So a shout out um, to you. But David, I'll, I'll stop there. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Jackie. That was excellent and, and really gives a sense of the excitement and the momentum now. Now, our next speaker was slated to be Nicola Hutchinson, who's been a massive, massive supporter of the HSC right from its inception, actually, in terms of the bid as well. Nicola's unfortunately gone down with a migraine literally in, uh, just before we've come on. So she's not able to speak just now, but she's, she's kind of listening in. Um, so I won't put her on the spot because, as I say, she's really not well enough. But um, I would also now like to pass over to um, Alison McDowell. Um, Alison is, uh, is the Director of Adult Social Care and Integrated Services at Newcastle City Council. And she's been, again, absolutely committed to the cause at a personal level. I, I will just give a shout out for that at multiple different fora and, and events. Um, and, and, and I think represents an area that the link between health and social care as we try to tackle the inequalities that Jackie referred to it's going to be absolutely critical. So, um, Alison, I'm going to pass, pass straight over to you. Thanks, David. <clears throat> Thanks very much. And, and I'm, I, I'm absolutely delighted 
to be here representing Pam, Pam Smith, the new chief exec for Newcastle City Council. So I'm hopefully going to try and have a bit of a quick conversation about local authority in the round as much as I would love to spend three minutes entirely uh, talking about social care. I will try and, and, and actually give you the flavour of where we are from a local authority perspective, because for, for, for us, NHIP is one of the few uh, academic organisations that the NHIP has local authority is part of. We were one of the founding members of this particular uh, uh, health innovation partnership. And that has been a really special thing for the city, I think. It's been incredibly special for the local authority. And we're proud to be able to bring with that the contributions of everything that we that we embrace in local authority. So we've got the expertise and the breadth and the leverage that I think has made a bit of a difference, a specific one, if you're looking at, at comparisons within there. So we know our population. And that's one of the things that is very specific to, to the local authority in the sense that we are very close to that person-centered way to the residents in the city. We're responsible for a, a, a wide range of, of services. And as David mentioned, I would always put social care right up there as one of the first aspects to that. But actually we've got the schools within us, housing, planning, some of our regulatory services, and of course, public health. And when we've seen how we've been with the last two years in NHIP, I think you'll be able to see in the work plans and the understanding and the bids, the type of uh, granular information that that's been able to bring through. From an NHIP perspective, it seems very clear to, to those local authorities' boundaries as well. We're here to maintain and to grow and to improve local infrastructure and community services. And if we do that within the boundaries, as we've seen in NHIP, as David mentions, that then has a ripple effect of singing loud and pride into the region, into the nation, and even internationally. And that's where we're seeing some of the different flavors. When you're looking at being able to understand in some of say the industrial strategies that we're looking at where the roads fit in how, how, how can we monitor and, and understand the traffic environment the, the, the environments and the recreation aspects so again those different flavors within our collaboration is incredibly important and all of that and I'm sure people are very uh, sick of me banging on about this sometimes, but all has the distinct ethos of we're the closest door to local democracy. And that brings something very special. And I think as we can see, and I'm sure people will mention going through the, the rest of this uh, workshop, that, that feels that we bring that people engagement for the whole of the city closer. And that brings a richness to us. The voice of, of local residents is something that uh, is, is very important in how we look at research. We bring a bit of research through to a different lens. This means that we can take innovations and find ways to apply them so that they have the most impact on population. And that is really quite a game changer for us. And we're very grateful for being part of NHIP to enable us to have that game changer within the city. So, We've seen that we've been working on our joint industrial strategy and all of the aspects of that has, has, has brought us together. It's the shared ambitions that, that NHIP has allowed us to do and the shared ambitions of being able to stretch into areas of research that we wouldn't ordinarily have been able to reach and the capabilities of maximizing that into local economic growth. Uh, we've also been working together as part of it uh, with our mental health partners. So again, things that we would do ordinarily has been giving a special different lens to it, a bit of a sparkle because of the NHIP world around that and promoting mental health and promoting well-being. It's one of those steps into being able to really look at inequalities. And we know that moving forward in social and health inequalities is one, is one of the aspects that we're very committed to doing. We're wanting to find ways of embedding research capacity within local authorities. And we, we have analysts, but actually embedding research into local authorities, having our services and all of those sphere of influence that we have in the city to be research friendly is, is, is a continual goal and NHIP helps us to bring that forward. And as uh, Dame Jackie said, 
the, the richness of shared data, the richness of understanding where that data can, can take us is very important as well. So on our further plans, we want to grow with NHIP, the, the industrial strategy. How does that work through into seeing the contribution that we have in the collaboration that we do have? How can we learn from our research partners so that our practice makes a difference? So that full circle is something that we should really be able to articulate. We bring the local authority into this environment, but actually what we bring back out of this environment into uh, uh, positive impacts for the people of the city and uh, further and beyond is really quite uh, unique within this uh, collaboration. And we need to find ways of strengthening uh, the voice of local people in our research. We need to do that and we need to be able to bring some of that into NHIP as well. And I think really from my point of view, uh, David, it is, as mentioned, that change in citywide culture and that shared ambition that we can be part of is really special within this. And I, I am so pleased, as I say, to, re to uh, represent Pam Smith and the commitment that Newcastle City Council has into this partnership. Thanks, Alison. That's really appreciated. And uh, actually, just to reiterate that uh, our AHSC is the only one that has a city council within it as a partner. So it is very it is different and it's special. So I'm going to move swiftly on to Simon Douglas, who's director of R&D at CNTW. Um, and Simon will give a bit of a perspective from the CNTW um, side of things. Simon, thank you. Thanks, David. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see us. Great. So good morning, everyone. My name is Simon Douglas. I'm Director of Social Innovation at Cumbria, Northumberland, Town and Weir. I'm standing in today for James Duncan, our Chief Executive, who is unable to be here today. I'm really delighted to be here to celebrate the first two years of Newcastle Health Innovation Partners and to look forward to the future with even stronger collaborative work. This Academic Health Science Centre is a highly prestigious award for our region. Um, and will ultimately drive innovation and investment. But what's really exciting to me is that we aim to translate the benefits of NHIP into real improvements to practice and treatments for those who use our services and live in our communities. As a mental health and disability trust with a wide regional footprint, we work collaboratively with a range of partners in Newcastle and beyond. And we have a research and innovation strategy which aligns well with the aims of NHIP and prov promotes collaborative working to ensure the best value to the region. In addition, as the host organization for another regional collaboration in the Applied Research Collaboration, or ARC, we aim to ensure that the research and evaluation which we develop is implemented into practice across the region and beyond and enables the NHS partners to maintain and improve their outstanding clinical services. And of course, as Dame Jackie just pointed out, their CQC ratings. So what have we achieved? Working together with NHIP partners, we've built on successful programs of research in dementia and mood disorders, including securing significant funding in these areas. And recently, we spun out a new virtual reality company, which provides a high-tech approach to treatment of phobias and anxiety for people with autism. We've been influential in the development of NMAP research careers, which is one of the important building blocks of an organizational culture, which promotes research and innovation as a significant embedded and essential part of good quality care and treatment. We're also leading on the co-production of research with experts by experience and carers as part of our strategy for public and community involvement and engagement. This includes developing opportunities for training, including a university accredited course to enable those who experience mental health conditions to develop their skills to be able to make meaningful contributions to future research. So looking to the future, we're now in the first stages of develop, developing and delivering a program of work which will support the partnership to be more active in research, which relates to mental health of our population, including where there are both physical and mental health conditions together. And we also want to make sure that we enable the inclusion of those with mental health conditions to take part in research which is relevant to them, something that doesn't always happen. In addition, we'll be instrumental in driving forward two significant collaborative programs which are also aligned to priorities of the new integrated care system. These are suicide and self-harm reduction and the mental health and well-being of the health and care workforce. Both of these areas are key topics of interest at the current time, so we look forward to working with partners to develop them. And as Ali mentioned, the opportunity to work with the council is quite unique in this field. 
So we're really pleased to be part of NHIP and to look forward to delivering real outcomes that make a difference to our population and communities over the coming years. Thank you. That's, that's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Simon. Much appreciated. Um, really, again, very exciting real developments and aspiration there. And then um, we're now going to move on to some committee updates. So a couple of real time updates, if you like. Firstly, from Moira, who I, I introduced before, but just to reiterate, she's the exec, exec chief nurse for Newcastle Hospitals um, and is heading up the people and culture committee. So Moira, over to you. Maura, I can see your screen, but we can't hear you. Um, I, we can see you. You can see the screen share. Yeah. Can you can you hear Got now? You. Yes. Thank you. Got you. I, now. Did, I did one without the other. Thanks, David. Um, so as uh, as David's already said, my name is Moya Kushler. I'm the exec chief nurse at Newcastle and um, have recently been appointed as the chair of the People and Culture Committee taken over from Professor Andy Fisher, who is the Dean of Clinical Medicine at Newcastle University. And really, it's uh, I wanted to say thank you to Andy for his leadership in getting us to where we are today in the People and Culture Committee. And as Dame Jackie's already mentioned, um, we have successfully appointed five high quality candidates in uh, as senior clinical fellows in intensive care medicine, vascular surgery, paediatric uh, respiratory medicine, rheumatology and haematology. And that's a real step forward, I think, for um, NHIP. In addition, through Diane Ford's leadership from at Northumbria University, we've developed three new innovative uh, role pilots, two posts in the area of social care research. And I think we've already heard how important um, that will be from Ali when she was talking about um, the work that the city council does and connecting to our communities across the city and how really that is important for NHIP going forward. And one is a, a physiological measurement associate to work in the community diagnostic center support and service delivery. One of the pieces of work that we're starting on through the course of this year um, under Dave Fawcett's leadership is to develop some work that scopes out a project that would increase access for underrepresented groups into a range of careers in research and innovation, including, but not wholly, just medical careers. And um, Dee has uh, secured some money, or we've secured some money through NHIP for some project management support, and we'll start to scope that out. And hopefully um, when we report back next year, we'll be able to show you some progress that we've made on that. Uh, we've undertaken a survey to identify, pr prioritise and remove barriers to collaborative work and in partnership, um, because as everybody will know, all of the organisations, we have our own infrastructure, our own governance arrangements, and sometimes makes that a little bit difficult, um, difficult to achieve. Some common themes have, ident have been identified and we'll start to address those uh, going forward. And then finally, the only thing I wanted to say was one of the things that uh, I want to do taking over chair of the committee is to just step back a little bit and think through what our plan for the year needs to be and how that meets the aspirations of the um, health innovation partnership going forward. Um, and I'd be more than happy to speak to people um, offline about that if they've got any particular contribution that they'd like to make for that. And I will stop there, David. Maura, that's really brilliant. And thanks so much. Uh, really Hi. nice, concise overview there. It's really great to have you in, in this uh, chair role. Uh, but I agree with you. I mean, it was, it was, Andy got us off to a good start, but this is going to be definitely focused, I know, under your leadership going forward uh, very positively. So um, I will, without any further ado, pass over to John Isaac. I think John's known to most, um, obviously he has a foot in several camps, but um, he's certainly uh, in this uh, capacity is speaking to you as the chair of the Research Strategy and Innovation Committee for NHIP. So John, over to you. Thank you, David. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely fine, John, Great. loud and clear, and we've got your screen share as well. So I've got a single slide just to talk about the Research Innovation Strategy Group. So the philosophy of 
philosophy behind our group is to generate collaborations between the partners to catalyze multidisciplinary research, leading to increased health and social care benefit with a particular focus on deprivation and inequality, uh, as you might expect. And the, the way our strategy works is first of all to understand the context, and, and you've probably heard a bit of this already, but, but NHIP doesn't come with any money, but it's highly prestigious. We're one of only eight around the country, five of which are in the Golden Triangle. Um, then there's Manchester, Bristol and ourselves. So in my head, it changes perceptions. I think having got this um, badge, it, it changes the way people think about us and we're a trusted partner. So it doesn't mean we have to work any less hard, but I think we can apply for brave and, and ambitious funding opportunities um, with, with the hope that we will be successful. So the way our committee works is to horizon scan for funding opportunities in areas of strength across the partners. One of my roles is to then generate interest and enthusiasm, enthusiasm amongst the partners. Um, and in doing that, identify a lead and support bid development. Now, David's already mentioned our satellites, and that's one way we get people together, even before we know the funding bids are there. So right at the beginning, we launched satellites around robotic surgery, led by um, Naeem Sumru and, and Paul Watson. There's an advanced therapeutic satellite, which I lead with Mark Jarvis, and then there's diagnostics and therapeutics Northeast, led by Michael Wright. Most recently, we're in developing two new satellites around sustainability, where there's lots of opportunities and mental health. So our progress. So what you haven't heard about is, is, is one big success in research was Nick Reynolds getting the so-called AI multiply bid. This was using artificial intelligence to look at electronic health records to understand the genesis of multimorbidity, particularly in the context of polypharmacy. So that really was a multi-partner bid. I think it involves four of the five partners worth 3.1 million pounds. I've then listed there some bids which are in, which David's already mentioned. So of course there's the BRC, there's the NIHR Patient Safety Research Center and the NIHR Health Determinants Research Center um, led by the council. Um, and again, as David mentioned in preparation, the Digital Health Innovation Hub, which again would be multi-partner, really exciting across research and education around digital capabilities. And then finally, other activities that we've, uh, Research and Innovation Strategy Group are involved in. So there's a, Alastair Burt is developing a biobanking strategy for Newcastle, bringing together various biobanks across the partners, which again, I think is very exciting. Sophie Hambleton is, is, is organizing some grand rounds, which again, we intend to be multi-partner to bring educational perspective to research and opportunities. And over Key McFarlane Reed's team are thinking about some Dragon's Den funding for later this year to, to tease out those really good ideas around innovation and, and give them some sort of seed support. We've launched a consultation around advanced therapies and are developing a strategy there. And there's some really exciting work going on around digital technology and the electronic patient record and what we can do with that across the region. So that was all I wanted to say, David, uh, for now. Um, That's brilliant, John. Really nice overview. Thank you very much as well. Um, now, we're going to take a bit of a risk here because we're moving on to a virtual uh, re pre-recorded format um, with Dave Jones. Um, and uh, he is going to give us a little bit of a video, we hope, on the importance of career development through the NHIP Academy. But I note actually also that uh, joining us today, uh, we'll have Nina Colomain, who works very closely with Dave on that, but also working closely, Annette Hand, uh, Professor of Nursing, and Linda Tinkler, who are, are, are both uh, more aligned with NUTH, although Annette's appointment spans to Northumbria, an affiliate member of, of NHIP, which is very, very welcome and, and helpful. And so, if there are questions on the academy um, or the general career developments, um, I'm sure that Nina, Annette, and Linda would be would be able to pick those up in the um, in the discussion if necessary. So, Anne Marie, I can't keep talking. I'm hoping yes, you've got it there. Great, well done. So, uh, over to you. My name is David Jones, and it's a real pleasure to lead for education and training in NHIP. 
It's been a really exciting year with a huge amount of progress and the most fun bit has been working with new colleagues on new projects. We're focusing on education and training because it's so important for the next generation and Newcastle has a wonderful history in this area. We are real pioneers in how we teach and train the next generation of researchers and clinicians. Our education programmes have major successes. We've won significant external bids in the areas of digital literacy and in training clinicians to be the trialists of the future. Really important bids with colleagues across the organisation. We're working on how to focus on the complex health needs of an ageing population in our undergraduate programmes. And I'm really delighted to say we've been working with colleagues in the business school and across NHIP to put a highly competitive tender in for the National Leadership Training Programme for NIHR. So education thrives in Newcastle. On the training side, we've created the NHIP Academy. This is an entirely new structure that brings career development support for academics across the board in health and care science, for medics and dentists, nurses, midwives, allied health professionals, in public health and social care, in pharmacy, healthcare science, uh, and in methodology. And we are working in each of those areas to develop exciting programmes so that we can support people to apply for the many fellowship programmes that are out there that really allow people to build their career. It's been a fantastic year, it's been a busy year, and over the next year our structures will be in place so that we can really offer something unique for people across the spectrum of research activity in clinical care and social care. So here's to NHIP and its next year. But you don't want to hear from me, the best advert for what we do is the people we work with, and it's a great pleasure to see a number of our colleagues talk about their research and how they're developing their careers within NHIP. Great. So um, that was a short and sweet uh, little taster there for the Academy. And obviously, uh, I mentioned the colleagues, if you want to know more about that. But um, without any further ado, we have um, Kenneth Baker, who's going to give us a three minutes in-person presentation um, from the perspective of an NHIP clinical fellow. Uh, so, Ken, over to you. Yep, great. Thanks, David. So, I'm um, Ken Baker. I I've been asked to give a whistle-stop tour as to who I am and what I do in three minutes. So here goes. So um, this is me. I, I effectively have two jobs. So I'm based at Newcastle Hospitals half of the time looking after rheumatology patients. Uh, the other half of the time I spend at the medical school uh, researching into rheumatoid arthritis. And my research interest can be summarised as this, predicting and understanding drug-free remission and flare in rheumatoid arthritis importantly for patient benefit, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And um, so this is a sketch from a medical textbook at the turn of the last century showing the ravages of uncontrolled rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, thankfully, we've come a long way since then. Ken, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, Ken. We're, we're just, I'm not sure if you meant to do it, but we're just seeing your title slide. It's oh, sorry. Fun. Yeah. Um, let me try. Yeah, that's moved on. Uh, this. So, yeah, this is, this is what you should have been seeing. Sorry for that. Um, so that this importantly for patient benefit here is, is, is the key part. Um, so this is a, a slide showing the uh, ravages of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is taken from a textbook at, at the turn of the last century. Um, but this is the outcome that many patients with rheumatoid arthritis can expect to see today. And we owe most of these advantages to the effective use of disease modifying drugs particularly uh, uh, with some side effects, however. So they are potentially toxic, they require money to prescribe and require regular blood test monitoring. So there's several drivers to want to reduce their use where possible. And this was our motivation in Newcastle to ask the question, could patients in remission stop their drugs? And if so, can we predict who's able to, uh, to do that? Um, so we've taken patients with stable rheumatoid arthritis who are keen to come off of medications. Uh, ask them to stop therapy and then follow them for six months. And in that time, half the group split into those uh, who maintained drug-free remission, whilst the other half had a, a flare of their arthritis, a mild to moderate degree. Um, and we asked the question, could we measure blood tests just before stopping drugs, which would predict which way patients have gone? The answer is yes, and we're developing several of those into clinical tests. 
but we're also looking to see can we identify changes at the onset of flare versus baseline uh, uh, to understand a bit more about the pathogenesis of disease. And um, so this work was originally funded through my PhD through a bit of uh, seed funding from our own BRC, but has led to many greater things, including funding from a lot of other external funders. So I think is a good example of how local funding targeted at an early career, uh, stage in someone's career development can make a big difference later on. And um, so this is my interest in research, but uh, as I say, I'm focused on patient benefit and I, I, I would like to see impact in other areas as well. So in terms of clinical innovation, I, I'm bringing forward drug tapering into the clinic. So trying to establish a, a clinic at the Freeman where we can make that part of routine care, but also looking at remote monitoring. So empowering patients to be able to measure their disease activity between clinic appointments uh, and use that to, to feed back to the clinical team to say, well, can we identify patients who are struggling between their visits uh, and also patients who are doing well, where we can perhaps spread apart their, um, uh, their clinic follow-ups. And finally, making use of routine clinical data. We've talked about this already, but for example, in rheumatology, we, had a, we have a, 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 a large amount of data in terms of safety drug monitoring for patients on these drugs. And can we use artificial intelligence to uh, improve our ability to pick up uh, adverse effects. And although these are three distinct areas, what I'm hoping to do is hit somewhere in the middle whereby research can improve clinical care and our clinical systems, which can in turn support further research and everything can go hand in hand ultimately for the benefits of our patients. Um, so it's been a real pleasure to talk to you today. Uh, I'll stop there and apologies for the, uh, the technical difficulties at the beginning. Okay, thanks very much. Well, uh, absolutely perfectly pitched. I love the use of the dart. And uh, and certainly it's absolutely in the area that um, Dame Jackie talked about earlier on in terms of pa real patient benefit and not least the use of the big data, which I think is going to be a massive opportunity. So thanks. Thanks for that. We're, we're going to fast forward now into a pre-recorded slot from Tom Hellier, who again was name checked earlier on with regard to um, work in the ITU. And again, I'm hoping Anne-Marie will manage to weave her magic Yep, it's looking good. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, and we'll hear from Tom, who, as you see, stuck to the brief at three minutes 13. So um, off we go. My name's Tom Heller. I'm a clinical researcher and consultant in intensive care medicine. And my particular field of uh, research is um, trying to optimise and improve how we give antibiotics to patients who are critically ill. Um, it's really important in this patient group. Um, critical patients are very, very vulnerable to infections in intensive care, and so they often receive a lot of antibiotics. But antibiotics carry huge risks as well. So most people will be aware of um, antibiotic resistance, but there are other consequences that people can, can suffer from, such as uh, toxicity of antibiotics. And so trying to refine um, the optimum use of antibiotics is, is really important, but it's really challenging. Intensive care research is also really important because it's a, it's, it's a field of research that captures a lot of people, um, a lot of hard to reach groups of patients. If you are sick and you need intensive care and you come through the A&E department, you will come to the ICU and, and our research will hopefully benefit, benefit those groups of patients. So my research takes a, a broad approach to tackling this problem. I lead one research project where we're taking a deep dive into the immune system and looking at whether patients have abnormalities in their immune system versus those who don't have abnormalities and seeing whether they have a different, um, uh, different use in antibiotics and, and different outcomes from their intensive care stay. And the hope is that research will lead to a precision medicine approach to antibiotics. My other study that I lead is a, is, is a, takes a very different approach. It's a, it's a large pragmatic trial that's asking a very simple question, which is, can we give shorter courses of antibiotics which are effective and safe, but then avoid a lot of the harms associated with the overuse of antibiotics? And this will be a large trial that will be carried out in over 2,000 patients from 50 intensive care units. There are many collaborators from within this university, but also from around the country. We have public and patient participation in the study. 
and <clears throat> the hope is that this trial would lead to a very fundamental change in the way that we treat critically ill patients with severe infections where we can give shorter courses of antibiotics and still get the same good outcomes for people but avoiding some of those harms. Through this partnership with academia, the NHS, industry partners and NHIP, I hope that this research is going to lead to fundamental changes in the way that we treat patients, lead to better outcomes for patients not only within our region but also across the UK and, and even globally to achieve better outcomes for the sickest patients in our community. Great. Well, thanks very much uh, to Tom, even though he's not here to say hear that. But I mean, obviously, uh, for the pre-recorded outline. Now, we do have Sandeep Nandra with us. And so welcome, Sandeep. But I believe that you're going to take control now and actually give us a presentation based on your research. Thank you. There we go. Thank you very much for allowing me to share my senior clinical fellowship of improving outcomes for Northeast vascular patients through collaboration. My name is Sandip Nandra, and I'm an honorary consultant vascular surgeon. So what is vascular surgery? Broadly speaking, it's about reducing the risk of death, limb loss or stroke by surgical intervention. We treat a wide range of clinical problems using several types of procedures such as open surgery or x-ray guided techniques. And who are our vascular patients that we treat? Well, many of them have multiple overlapping long-term conditions, such as heart attack, stroke, diabetes, or high blood pressure. And these are often coupled with adverse lifestyle factors, such as smoking or obesity, that make them hugely complex. But why do these patients and these conditions matter to, to the NHIP and to our region? Sadly, we have some of the highest rates of lower limb amputation due to vascular disease in the UK. Couple that with high rates of diabetic foot disease and high rates of cardiovascular disease in general, it leads to the perfect storm for bad outcome for our vascular patients. The big question is, why are we so badly affected here in the northeast of England? That is the aim of my senior clinical fellowship. Partnering with patients and colleagues across the region and trust, I've been able to start to unpick that relationship. One such partnership with the Biomedical Research Centre is to understand how ageing and strength might be linked to outcome, better or worse, for vascular patients. A further outcome is to evaluate the effect of anemia and how this might affect outcome. I've shown that this is people with low iron counts have worse outcomes, and perhaps through a collaborative application to the BHF, we might be able to improve that. Another area of research is looking at social economic status. Sadly, in the Northeast, we have some of the most deprived areas within the country. And it seems that those patients have a worse outcome following vascular intervention. And as yet, we do not understand why. And finally, health literacy is, a, is an area understanding patients' ability to read and interpret literature around their healthcare. Working with partners at the Applied Research Collaboration, I have been able to evaluate patients' understanding of their condition and how it might influence their outcome. And hopefully we can improve that through education. The main aim of this work is to try to restore the balance for our patients in the Northeast and in particular provide equitable vascular care, irrespective of background and socioeconomic status. Thank you very much for your time. I welcome any questions and comments at my Twitter handle or email. And thanks very much. That was absolutely fabulous. And uh, really, I love the graphic there at the end. That was absolutely superb. Um, but I mean, really bringing home the point we made and that in fact, Dame Jackie uh, made about needing to tackle the health inequalities. And uh, I think you're working in an area that really exemplifies that and, and the good work that you can do through the research. So thanks for that. Um, now, our last presentation is from Laura, Laura Jardine, and this is pre-recorded. Um, so again, Anne-Marie, um, Wonderful. And again, you can see that Laura has stuck to the brief. Thank you. My name is Laura Jardine. Today I start my new job as a senior clinical lecturer. My clinical work is in haematology, where I look after patients with blood and lymphoid cancers. 
In my time as a haematologist, there are two areas that have made real improvements to patient outcomes. The first is in improved risk stratification. That means identifying early who's going to need the most intensive treatments and who could be spared the toxic side effects of these treatments. The second is in precision medicine. That means interfering with specific pathways or signals or targeting particular cell types for removal. So building on these improvements, improvements is the ultimate goal of my work. In my research work over the past four years, I've spent my time building single cell multiomic atlases. So multiomics means making multiple simultaneous measurements of a single cell, for example, its location, the proteins expressed on its surface and the genes that it's expressing. My own work is focused on taking these measurements on blood and immune cells during development. And using this information, we can build a picture of blood producing cells and tissues and how they emerge and evolve during the human lifespan. So the majority of this work has focused on health, but now using these extensive atlases as references, I'll be able to turn my attention to blood cancers. So in one strand of work, I've mapped gene expression signals from childhood leukemias onto a reference of developing blood. I see variation in signals within well-defined risk groups. The next step I'll be taking is to identify whether these variations can predict outcomes. In another strand of work, I will be building up a single cell atlas of primary CNS lymphoma. This is a type of lymph cancer in the brain with very poor outcomes. I'll be examining interactions between lymphoma cells and the brain and immune cells surrounding it at a resolution that has not previously been possible. With this information, we'll be able to propose new strategies for interrupting survival signals and promoting killing of lymphoma cells. I would like to thank Newcastle Health Innovation Partners for giving me the opportunity to pursue this work and I hope to be able to update you on my progress in the near future. Great. Well, thanks to Laura for that. And um, so um, great to hear such contrasting and really uh, encouraging tales from, from our last four speakers as clinical fellows. And we're going to move now into an area that effectively defines what we do. Um, and I'm really pleased uh, to, to welcome um, Julie Murphy and Paul Cord. I, I don't see Lynn joining us. Uh, unfortunately, as I say, I think she's unfortunately been called away by a, a health emergency within her family. Um, but Paul Cord is the chief executive at HealthWorks, and they've been a massive supporter of the um, academy, uh, the um, uh, Health Innovation Partners work throughout the um, really uh, the last year or more. Um, and we were put in touch with Paul, and he's, he's you'll hear from him in a second. He's been absolutely enthused and engaged with the whole of the programme of NHIP and also Julie Murphy who's a public engagement officer within uh, FMS but again Julie has um, although she's come more from a mitochondrial research background has embraced a wider remit across the partnership um, incredibly enthusiastic as well so um, I think it might be the two of you Julie and Paul so over to you if that's all right. Hi everybody, yes, I'm Julie Murphy and I work with Lynn Corner and Paul Court. Sorry, I've got a very noisy dog in the background who's just asleep at talk. Um, and I work with patient and citizen engagement. It's gonna be one of those days, I think. So the aim of our, um, our patient and citizen engagement is to improve health outcomes and address health inequalities across the region through first-class patient and citizen engagement. We're going to do this by communicating, listening, strengthening partnerships, celebrating success, and also evaluating our activity. I am so sorry there. Um, throughout this port assess, we will engage and involve seldom heard groups within our region. And we are going to do this. Um, so the first step in this process is working together with internal NHIP partners to ensure their needs are met. So this month we're running a co-design session. This is independently facilitated event to develop our patient and citizen engagement strategy. We'll be using, sorry, I'm just going to, Paul, would you mind taking over and explain about a little bit about HealthWorks? Is that okay? Well, I'll, I'll do the bit about HealthWorks. I'll Thank shoot you. Uh, your talk. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, um, HealthWorks is one of the leading Northeast charities 
uh, working with disadvantaged local communities to tackle health inequalities and improve their health and well-being through social prescribing. We're based in Newcastle, but work across the region um, for over 25 years. Our patron is Professor Marmot, and our vice chair is Tricia Cresswell, um, who some of you may be familiar with. Um, so we work in partnership with NHS and local authority colleagues and communities in many sectors to devise cost-effective solutions that secure sustainable health impacts for many conditions that inhibit quality of life. So we deliver behavioral change interventions for obesity, smoking, diabetes, breastfeeding, antenatal support, cardiac rehab, rehab for people with chronic joint pain, cancer awareness, reducing falls and increasing exercise for older people. And in terms of supporting NHS hospital activity, we've been working very closely with trusts, including Newcastle, to develop both perioperative and rehab for a range of conditions and additional specific targeted interventions for our most disadvantaged uh, communities, however that's defined, who are most in need as part of active recovery support. Um, we've also been having discussions with Sam Allen and her team um, to support some of the ICS's aims around the core 20 plus five um, to deliver at place and in neighborhoods of lowest super output areas. Um, with the right support, obviously we can build and deliver it at scale. Um, and most of our interventions are formula evaluated by amongst other people at the universities across the region. So one of the ambitions of HealthWorks when I came to post was to be a key partner in health inequalities research. And obviously that's something that David touched on that we've been working on over the last year in partnership um, with NHIP and uh, the universities across the region. We've embedded PhD studentships and placements into our working practice. Um, we've managed to secure funding from ARC to explore uh, multimodal uh, telehealth behaviours for peripheral arterial disease and soci low socioeconomic areas. We've been supporting long COVID research project, um, which has led to service delivery now in uh, Newcastle Hospitals Trust. Um, we're also developing um, work around uncontrolled diabetes reversal before elective and major surgery. And I believe that is going, uh, is out for awaiting well funding. And um, we were recently honoured by an award from the King's Fund for our significant impact um, in the community and our commitment to health and well-being in the Northeast. So that's a little bit about health work and how we're working with Julie and Hip and our partners across the universities and trusts um, to ensure embedding good practice and well-evaluated um, proper research outcomes, evidenced work across uh, communities. Great, thanks, Paul, very much. Now I think you've bought Julie some essential time. <laughs> I just want to mute her, mute her canine. So, uh, Julie, are you, are you back with us? What a nightmare! Sorry, the dog is still alive. Just um, uh, okay. So basically what I just wanted to highlight is that we're going to be working with NHIP partners. We're going to use a design-led approach to work together with partners, make sure that they're represented in everything that we do and develop our strategy moving forward. And we want to be really inclusive so that everybody gets their views. We're not reinventing the wheel and we're moving forward and we're going to have an action plan that's beneficial to all partners. We're also going to be doing that with HealthWorks to make sure our community groups are also benefiting from this and that their input is essential in what we're doing to make sure we have real impact within our communities. Thank you. <laughs> oh no, that's great. Thanks. Okay, that's wonderful. Well, thanks, thanks to the both of you for um, for managing to pick up that slot um, and and also for for keeping to to time. So that does give us fifteen minutes now for Q and A. And what I propose is to make this very free flow. In other words, um, any of the contributors who who have have, have, have um, added to the your understanding of the last hour, I think could be asked questions. And for example, I see straight off, there's a question coming from uh, Caroline in uh, Austin, um, which I think will be for yourself, Ken, on are there genetic differences in patients who flare with regard to their rheumatoid arthritis? Uh, yes, it's, it's a good question. So we, we've looked at some of the biomarkers we've looked at have been uh, gene expression in circulating white blood cells. 
So we have picked up some uh, differences in gene expression. We, we found that a little bit difficult to translate towards a clinical test because the technology is not quite there yet. So it's, it's, it's hard to see how it's it went more steps involved, I guess, to bring that through to an NHS test. Um, so we've been refocusing, looking at different levels of inflammatory proteins in the bloodstream for these patients, which is a bit more you know, easily translatable to the technology we have in, in the NHS labs. Um, and that's looking quite promising. So um, yeah, there's, there's several avenues that we're looking at to move us closer to a, a diagnostic test. Yeah. Great. Thank, thanks. Thanks, Ken. That's, that's really great. Good, concise answer. And I, again, I just draw colleagues' attention to the fact that Claire Robinson um, has left a message in and, and, and Catherine and Amy, if I might ask just to make a note of that one um, to link in uh, with the uh, Claire, who's a cluster manager for the Internet of Caring Things in, in Nick A. Um, and Karen Ross, who again has, has very kindly popped in a link there. Um, Karen, you, some of you may know, did a, a lightning talk on menopause um, a, a, a short time ago for NHIP um, and has put a link on there. Um, I, one of the things that Paul uh, mentioned, Paul Court mentioned, would just cross my mind that we hadn't really touched on, and I certainly didn't, and maybe Jackie, um, I, I'm going to just pop you on the spot here, perhaps yourself primarily, but there may be others who wish to, to comment. But we've talked about integrated care system very briefly there, Paul made reference to it. And I am struck when I look at the number of uh, colleagues who've signed in, that, that they're probably coming, some of them from a more pure university background, certainly not necessarily in a position of knowledge of, of the integrated care system. So I <laughs> Jackie, I don't know whether in a couple of minutes you're able to give a very quick outline about what the ICS is um, and what the opportunities might be for NHIP in working with the ICS. Is, is that all right to, to send you yeah, that? Yeah, of course. Well? I think there are probably two ends of that that I could just describe in a few, few seconds, really. Um, the first is the integrated care system and integrated care board that comes into legal form on the 1st of July. So it's, it's really coming down the tracks now. Um, uh, Sam Allen is the chief exec, Liam Donaldson, who many of you might remember, is the chair, and they've now appointed a team of people um, to work across that space. There are 11 foundation trusts, and there are 13 places like Newcastle, um, so lots of interfaces. It's the largest in the country, um, and it's, it's, you know, its primary purpose is around health inequalities, it works across health and social care, into primary care, so it really is a connector of all the bits. There are other infrastructure in that integrated care system space, David, like you know the academic health science network that Nicola would have spoken to us about, but also, of course, all of the other kind of research infrastructure, the NIHR infrastructure that involves many trusts in the region. So we're really hoping that we can create this umbrella, if you like, for the family of you know, universities, of trusts, of, um, and the whole system to be able to come together and work together. Um, but um, it's in its infancy, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm really enthused about it because I think the benefits of working right across the system with our communities deep in place is, um, is absolutely what we should be doing. Wow, fantastic! <laughs> that that was a that was a brief and a half, and thank you for thank you for covering that so so nicely there. And so hopefully that was a nice sound chunk for colleagues who are not so aware of ICS. Um, I'm I'm going to ask Simon Douglas. I can't just see him quite on my screen, but I'm sure he's still with us. And again, others may want to pitch in here, but. CNTW, um, Simon's obviously got a very large geographical footprint, which is coterminous with, with the Academic Health Science Centre for North East North Cumbria. Why is research so important to a trust like CNTW? What, what value added does it, does it bring? I know, I know to some of us that's kind of an obvious question, but when you're mired down in the day-to-day -day runnings of a very major health organisation, um, and perhaps also with an eye on balancing the books, you know, research might be regarded by some as a bit of a nice to have, but why is it more than a nice to have, Simon? Thanks, David. <clears throat> really a <good> question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think um, it's more and more recognised that um, research isn't just a nice to have, that it's something that 
actually is a marker of good quality in clinical services and clinical treatment. Um, and evidence is certainly showing more and more that um, the most research active organizations have better outcomes for patients, and not just those involved in research. So I think there's a really good reason why, why we do research. Um, and it leads to um, obvious improvements in our clinical care and treatments. It enables us to provide evidence of that and the good quality that we provide. Um, and I think it just generally shows that we are um, forward thinking and we, we want to make sure that we improve as far as possible. So I think there's, a, there's lots of good reasons why we do it and we're really, really pleased to be involved in it. Thanks very much, Simon. That's that's great. Now, Neil Watson's asked, Neil, you must be psychic, actually, because I was just about to ask you a question and actually go off piece. But you've actually asked us a question, which is uh, great to hear about some exciting, innovative technologies to transform elements of healthcare. Are we considering how we better understand digital exclusion to avoid widening inequalities? The short answer is yes, we definitely are. And, and I think, Neil, in a way, that's a slightly loaded question because you know that within the um, the, the, the um, patient um, safety collaborative that uh, Jackie referred to, uh, Dim Jackie referred to before that we went down for the interview, that that was actually a question we got from the panel um, about digital exclusion, which was very well handled by Sheena Ramsey. Um, but um, I'm going to actually ask to whether they want to expand on that, Julie. That might and Paul, that might well be in your patch could i ask you to maybe broaden that answer i mean by working together with healthworks we're going directly into the community so we're working directly with community members so it's about understanding issues associated with digital exclusion and working together with those communities to make sure that they're included in everything that we're doing i mean paul's paul's based in healthworks that's where we're going to be working with somebody who is going to be employed directly and working within those communities of seldom heard communities so they'll be discussing and coming up with ideas and solutions around that. Is that right, Paul? Yeah, yeah. And we're, we're exploring some of that as well through um, Digital Health Hub uh, regional bit as well, um, which is being led on by Abby Durant as well. So, so we're exploring that with her. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, this is where my multitasking capabilities, um, particularly with jet lag, are starting to fail slightly. So um, we've got... Um, a, a couple of kind of more to notes here. Um, so Susan, thank you very much for the great new resource to find out more about an IHR in the Northeast, uh, North Cumbria, which is, 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 is good. That's a good reference to look at. And then Hamina uh, has put in about um, wanting to make links or interested to follow up with anyone looking to industry participation to help answer some of these big digital inclusion slash health inequality challenges. So I'll, I'll let colleagues read read that because I'm not going to read out the full comment in the chat. Um, so I'm not going to let him. Uh, and then Catherine's answered, Caroline, thank you about the NHIP um, uh, link with the, uh, the engagement in place. So I think um, my question to Neil, you're not going to get away with it. Um, and John Isaacs may want to come in on this as well, relating to sustainability. So Neil, I know you and I had a brief talk. I mean, my eyes were opened rather just before Christmas uh, by talking to wonderful um, sustainability champions, um, uh, James, particularly in, in, in the trust about the sustainability angle in medicines. Um, and I'm thinking here about stuff like packaging, but things that were brought to my attention, like using the wrong type of inhaler and the propellant. And so just your comments and the possibilities, Neil, on, on the sustainability angle with regard to healthcare in general, but maybe coming at it more from your background in pharmacy. Yeah, thanks David, sorry, I thought I'd diverted you uh, significantly enough. That, I must have known it was coming. So, um, I mean, certainly uh, you may all uh, be aware that we've, uh, in fact, we have literally just signed up to uh, being part of the Sustainability Medicines Partnership, uh, which is a, a national uh, piece of work, um, really looking at the impact that medicines have more generally on, um, on carbon footprint, which you might be surprised is a very significant proportion of, uh, of um, carbon for, for the health service. So certainly uh, medicines are a really important part of uh, looking at how we can reduce our carbon footprint. And so working very closely with colleagues nationally and, and particularly uh, with some uh, 
amazing expertise, which I've uh, discovered in recent weeks within Newcastle hospitals that have been looking at sustainability. Um, so I think sustainability uh, within an NIH, NHIP is going to become an, an ever-growing topic, and I'm certainly very keen to, uh, to support that. And there's various elements, of course, that we should be looking at, but certainly with my historic hat on around um, our, med our own medicines, I think there's a huge amount to do, whether it be through absolutely through packaging, uh, or of course, indeed through, um, I think uh, John mentioned uh, polypharmacy earlier, uh, there's nothing more wasteful than a medicine that ends up not actually getting into a patient uh, if, it's, uh, if it's not gonna be taken. So there's a huge amount of work there to do around, uh, around polypharmacy. So I, I, it's a topic that we can perhaps talk on for a long time, but it's certainly no, a great question. No, that's great. I pre appreciate the conciseness. John, I don't know if there was anything further that you wanted to add, because obviously uh, the sustainability satellite is a new addition, and uh, you may have a different angle or perspective just in a minute there a, 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 about w where you were coming from with that. Yeah, no, thanks, David. I mean, Neil's given some great examples. There's also a really good example around the use of anaesthetic gases and, and, and more sustainable anaesthesia. I think the big message though is that there is, you know, rightly so much funding out there. All the major funders, Wellcome Trust, MRC, NIHR, all have multi-million pound uh, uh, budgets for research into sustainability, not, not just around healthcare, but with big healthcare elements. And, and that's partly why we've, we're developing the satellite because we see the opportunities there. And as Neil said, there are lots of people with interest across the partners. So to me, it's an ideal example of where a satellite can really make a difference. Fantastic. Thanks, John. I really appreciate the brevity of the answer too as well. And um, I'm seeing that there are questions being answered um, in, in, the, um, in the chat, which is kind of really helpful, actually. And Moira's put some extra information again there about North Tyneside CCG. Um, so, um, and then Caroline's question's been answered by Felicity. Um, at least in part, and, and I'm sure there will be a lot more there, Karen, but I, we don't have time, I'm afraid, to, to go any, any further into that just now. Um, so really, I promised that we'd finish on time and we've got two minutes to go. So I am just going to thank, firstly, um, our, our speakers and contributors for really, I think, keeping the pace up. It was really lively and I hope you've all found it to be really informative, really wonderful, wonderful contributions. I really enjoyed it and, and I hope you all did too. And to thank the audience for um, sticking with us and um, for supporting and for the enthusiasm in the chat. And hopefully now you feel enthused and want to kind of get connected into the work of NHIP um, and do do reach out and get in touch uh, if, you, if, you would, if you would like to. And uh, we'd love to hear from you and try and build build networks. Um, a, a big shout out to um, Anne Marie, to Anne, uh, and to Judith for and, and anyone else who I've, I've omitted there who've helped with the organisation of this, which is, has taken quite a bit, as you can imagine, with the uh, the mixed format. And I think it's worked really slickly. And, and thanks for that. Um, so. There's a number of the speakers said, looking forward to coming and giving us updates. And boy, are we looking to give you more updates collectively as we go forward. And um, this is going to be a sustainable uh, adventure, to use the word, um, which we ent anticipate sincerely goes beyond the five year life of the uh, current award. So thanks for your time. We're looking forward to being in touch in the not too distant and look out for updates like lightning talks, et cetera, um, as we go forward. All right, Judas just put in fact put a reference to the next lightning talk on the 5th of July. So put that into your diaries and she can give you more details if you need to know time, etc. So thanks all very much. Stay safe and see you all soon, I hope.